In our gospel today, a scholar of the law asks Jesus which is the greatest commandment. And Jesus answers, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And then the second commandment is just like the first one. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. We see here Jesus enumerating or telling us two commandments. The first commandment that pertains to love of God corresponds with the first three commandments of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, the commandments that pertain to man's relationship with God, the vertical dimension, man's relationship with God. And then the second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, corresponds to that second pillar of the Ten Commandments, Commandment 4 through 10, which is about man's relationship with his neighbor, our horizontal dimension. So what we see here is we've got a vertical dimension, and then we've got a horizontal dimension. A vertical dimension, a horizontal dimension. The commandments are fill, fulfilled in the cross. It's cruciform. Following the commandments is like a cross. It's cruciform. Let's reflect for a moment just how great this first commandment is, for it truly is a great commandment. The first thing that you will notice, if you are like me, is that one who tries to follow this first commandment of loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, or with all your soul, is you realize very quickly, I don't have the resources to do that on my own. I don't have the ability to conjure up love of God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind on, your, on my own, unless I have received that love first. And that's the key. It is God who does the loving first. As a matter of fact, the original promulgation of this commandment, which Jesus is quoting, is from Deuteronomy. And it's the great Shema. This is the great call to prayer that even our Jewish brothers and sisters today recite every single day. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu. Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is your good. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord alone. Therefore, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, or in this case, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. But notice, the first part of that commandment calls us to hear, to listen, to become aware of the fact that the Lord truly is God. Become aware of how the Lord is reaching out to love you. Become aware of how he has set you free from slavery, Israel. Become aware of the fact that the Lord has saved you by a mighty arm. You walked through the Red Sea, dry shod, and your enemies were buried in the water. Become aware of that and realize the Lord is your God. He is your God. He cares about you. He knows you. He loves you. Become aware of that. And all of a sudden, we're able to love the Lord. And our love is really a response to something that God has done first. And all of a sudden, I'm able to give of my heart to him because I trust him. I'm able to give my soul to him because I trust him. I'm able to give my mind to him because I trust him. And so the first part of that commandment is simply being still and knowing that the Lord is God. Our love is always a response. And therefore, this is truly a great commandment. This commandment is also a great commandment for another reason. It reveals to us our true dignity as sons and daughters of the Lord, our true dignity. If you think about it, God commands us to love him. Isn't that amazing? The God of the universe, the God who created all things, the God who does not need us one bit, the God who is complete in himself. It's not like he's lacking in, it, in anything. He's complete in himself. He's perfect. And yet, he commands us puny little creatures to actually love him because he wants to enter into a relationship with us. And our response to love for him actually makes a difference. Our love, your love, your love for God, in a sense, moves God. It actually makes a difference. You're not just a number amongst this mass of people. Your particular love makes a difference to God. If you want to think about that, that is truly amazing. What that means is God is very intimate. He's very particular. 
He's very caring to each and every one of us. And in a sense, God makes himself vulnerable to us. He makes himself vulnerable to us in that he becomes lovable. He wants us to love him. And when we don't love him, he actually misses us. He actually has an affection for us. Oh, my beloved, he doesn't want to talk to me. And it kind of hurts. God actually cares about us that much. That's really amazing to think about, that we puny little creatures, dust, as, as obscure as we think we are, we are that important in the mind of God that he would command us to love us, to love him, for our benefit, precisely because we have that much of a dignity and he sees each and every one of us. Isn't that amazing? That is truly amazing. That is why this commandment is truly a great commandment. Another reason why this commandment is a great commandment, it highlights to us the power of love. Love is the most powerful force in the universe. Love is more powerful than hate. Love is more powerful than nuclear bombs. Love is the most powerful reality in the universe. As a matter of fact, we hear from John, God is love. God is love. Before anything was, God was. Love was. God himself is an infinite exchange of love. Father, Son, and Spirit pouring in love with one another. And out of that love, God creates creation out of love. And then he gives us, puny little creatures, human beings, this capacity to love, this capacity to love him, a love that moves and does something to him. Now imagine when we unleash that power that moves God amongst one another in loving our neighbor, the second commandment. Imagine what good that does in the world. Imagine how powerful and creative that force is. We clearly see it in the family when husband and love, wife love one another. It's a creative force. It has power. It actually begets new life. We see it in the world when we do things out of love. It does something. It moves the world. It changes the world. It makes the world a better place. And so we see here, my dear friends, the amazing power of love. And this great commandment highlights this reality to us. And in a sense, we're being reminded of the fact that you and I are called to love God. Now, at the beginning of the homily, I told you, the fulfillment of the love of, the, of these commandments is the cross. And I think the cross, especially the cross of Christ, is a particular place where it becomes, at least for me, easier to live out these two commandments. Go to the cross. I can tell you when you go to the cross, it actually becomes a little bit easier to live out these two commandments. To truly love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind. And I can explain to you how. If you think about it, on the cross, I mean, just look at him. I know those of you in the back can't see the crucifix, but whatever. <laughs> you know what it looks like. But look at it. He's hanging there. He's hanging there, pouring himself out in love to us. As Mother Teresa says, as he hangs up on that cross, as we hear from St. John, Jesus is saying, I thirst. I thirst. And when he says that, he's not merely thirsting for physical water. He's thirsting for your affection. He's thirsting for your love. He's thirsting for you to show him your love because he's pouring himself out, literally dying to love you. And I can tell you, as you contemplate, as you ponder, as you look at Jesus suffering on the cross for you, for me, for my sins, that love has a way of piercing our hearts. It pierces our hearts. It fills us with compassion, with sorrow, but it's a sorrow of wow, awe, and it pierces our hearts. And when it pierces our hearts, all of a sudden, it's almost like I'm capacitated to love. I can give you my heart, Lord, because you're clearly giving of yourself to me. I can give my heart to you, Lord. I can surrender my heart to you, Lord. That's not a problem because I'm seeing how much you're surrendering yourself to me. I can give you my soul. Lord, come into my soul. Come into my soul. Look at you. You're saving me. Come into my soul. I can love him with my soul. Lord, I ponder and I think and I consider and I meditate on the wonder of what you're doing. I love you with my mind, my whole mind. And all of a sudden, I surrender my whole being to the Lord, precisely because of what I'm seeing. 
And in a very real way, the cross becomes a concrete place where it becomes possible to truly live out this commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. The cross also becomes a place where we learn how to live the second commandment. Because if you remember, in John's gospel, Jesus elevated the second commandment. It's no longer love your neighbor as yourself. Before he died, Jesus says, I give you a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. So the standard is no longer loving my neighbor as myself. I'm now called to love my neighbor as he has loved me. And so once again, the cross, the school of love, I begin to learn what it even means to love my neighbor. And I start to imitate him. Loving my neighbor means sacrificing for my neighbor, desiring my neighbor's good, even sometimes if it's uncomfortable to me, even sometimes at my own expense, because that's what he's doing for me. Loving my neighbor means seeing the dignity of every single human being, precisely because he saw my dignity as he hung on that cross. Loving my neighbor becomes something that is entirely possible because it's animated by something that I have first received. And so my dear brothers and sisters, the invitation today, go to the cross, go to the cross. Do not be afraid to go to the cross. Receive love there. You will learn there how to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your strength, with all your mind, and you'll also learn there how to love your neighbor as he has loved us. That's basically my homily today. However, I just wanted to add an appendix, the last part. I just thought it would be interesting to not say something <laughs> about what the Pope's remarks this week, just to say something. It'll be like, okay, everybody's expecting us to say something, so we will say something. Anyways, you may have heard in the media the report of the Pope saying some of those statements, and I kind of looked at the video. I saw the video, it was a video about four minutes long. Now my Spanish is not that good, so there was a more extended version, but I kind of picked up what he was saying. The first part of the video, the Pope is really affirming the catechism's teaching, and he's talking, he's very personal and he's a very loving man, and he's basically affirming the church's teaching in the catechism, which talks about the distinction between inclinations and acts, and he says, the inclination is not a sin. When one has same-sex inclinations, that's not a sin. It's only a sin when one acts on those inclinations. And then later on, he starts discussing this idea that people who have these inclinations should not be excluded from their family. And when he's speaking about family, they, in the context of the discussion, it seems to me it's clearly talk about, talking about family of origin. He's saying people should not be excluded from their family of origin just because they have this inclination. Now, the part that's controversial is the part where he says he recommends these things that he calls um, Conviviencia civil, something like that, or conviviencia civil, civil union, which is how it's translated. I think it says conviviencia civil or convivience civil, and many are translating that as civil unions. Because when he says that, it sounds like he's now going against documents that the church has already come up with and the teaching of the church, which, which is basically, well, you can't, you can't elevate something that's not an actual union to simulate marriage in any way. So that's where the controversy is with that particular statement. Now my hope is that, you know, the church or the Vatican will come and clarify. And I think it's important to realize that church teaching is not promulgated through TV interviews. There is a process, we have encyclicals, we have ex cathedra statements, we have, you know, different kinds of statements that are given officially that would change church teaching. So in this case, this is a TV interview. He's speaking very personally to somebody within the context. It's, it, it just doesn't make any sense that it would change. And why would it contradict scripture? Why would it contradict the teaching of the church? And so at the very least, at the very least we'll acknowledge this is kind of a scandal, <laughs> right? It kind of shakes people's faith because many people think the Pope is contradicting the teachings of the church or is holding an opinion that contradicts the teachings of the church. And I think prudence, prudence, I don't know, I'm not the Holy Father, but that can be a little bit disturbing. And I would also say this, you know, I think it's important again, the cross. The cross is our friend. The cross is our friend. Sometimes I have a feeling that in our desire, and I'm not, I'm just speaking in general, in our desire to be welcoming and to be accepting, Sometimes I'm wondering, are we denying people the cross, you know, in our desire to be accepted? Are we denying people the cross? The cross 
Jesus says, in order to be a disciple, pick up your cross and follow me. And so sometimes discipleship is tough. It means sacrifice. But that's what we're here for, to help one another carry that cross, not to take it away. And I'll just say, especially with Peter, from Matthew chapter 15 or 16, if you remember Caesarea Philippi, when Peter denied the cross, he stopped being a pontiff, a bridge. That's what we call the Pope, pontiff, a bridge. He became a scandalon, a stumbling block, right? He made trip, people trip and fall. What do I mean by that? Remember Caesarea Philippi? After Jesus had declared Peter the Pope, you are rock and on this rock I'll build my church. And then the next line, Jesus starts to explain that he's going to suffer, die, and rise again. And then Peter, well-meaning, pulls Jesus aside and he says, God forbid, Lord, nothing like this will ever happen to you. Come on. And he begins to rebuke Jesus. And then how does Jesus respond? I'm going to shout. He says, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. You're an obstacle to me. You're not thinking as God does. Remember that? Get behind me, Satan. That's what he called his first pope. When Peter denies the cross, he stops being a bridge. He becomes a scandal, an obstacle. People trip over and fall. That's what Jesus said. Pick up your cross and follow me. We can't deny people the cross. We have to help them carry their cross. When we start trying to be so nice that we deny the cross, people are going to fall. And that's my pastoral concern as a priest, that many people hear this, they've heard this, and they now think, oh, it's okay, yeah, I can do whatever I want now. The Pope has said it. And they trip. And so prudence, I, I don't know. And, and it's sad that sometimes they don't clarify. They drop these bombs. They've, they've done this before in the Vatican. And then they never clarify. And my fear is people trip and fall because they don't understand the distinctions we make. And so my hope is that people can come truly to follow Jesus. And we are here to help you carry your cross. We are here to walk with you. We're here, as Pope Francis himself says, to accompany you in love, but to help you carry your cross so that we can all come to the same goal, which is heaven. Praise be Jesus Christ.